So, I'm just going to give you a personal view of what I've learned about giving grants, what you might call grantsmanship. I'm not sure if there's a politically correct way of saying grant personship. I don't think it quite sounds right. But anyway, um, it's, it's just my view of how uh, things work out. I'm going to be provocative. So that's a, that's a warning, okay? So if you've got a delicate disposition, then just steal yourself. Debbie in particular is going to start foaming uh, with, re with outrage as I say things I suspect because I'm going to, but we'll come on to that more. So what, what credentials have I got at all to come and talk to you? Well, I've had a few grants now, uh, BBS and C project grants primarily, I've had nine of them as PI and I've been a co-I on five more. Um, when I was in Birmingham a few years ago, I was a co-investigator on a uh, that should say 10 million pound, not 10 pound, NIHR yeah. centre. Um, and I helped write that. Um, I've had a couple of MRC grants, and most recently, what the most recent one of those was an 8.4 million pound grant, which was a, an infrastructure grant which got funding for uh, four universities um, and then brings in uh, computational hardware which kind of matches the existing high performance capabilities of most of those universities. In Birmingham, I was also involved in a Wolfson bid, which I kind of hijacked and managed to get uh, a Cat3 lab uh, built for one of my colleagues. But, this is the but, I've also experienced failure. Uh, I've had at least five failed proposals. A couple of Lolas that I put in that failed these longer and larger grants. And my most recent BBSSC project grant application failed. So, uh, I'm not can't walk on water or anything like that. I think I've probably got a little bit more chance of getting grants than the average person, but it's certainly still, uh, sometimes I go wrong. Um, you can find out more about me there and follow me on Twitter. And this talk will be on my YouTube channel probably within the next 24 hours or so. And I'll put the slides onto SlideShare as well. Now this is the, another one of these caveats. Made this point. So, some of you may have seen this series that was on a few years ago, Shadow Line, very good series, and it's all about that line between right and wrong. And it's a shadowy line, and you don't quite know where it is, and it's very easy to stumble across it. Um, and that's why I'm saying well, I'm going to walk very close to the shadow line with some of the things I'm saying here, uh, but it's your risk. If you followed my advice, don't come back to me and say, I took your advice, and the BBS I see have sung me in jail or the university or whatever. I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to take responsibility for that. You, you, you take this at your own risk. Um, that reminds me, though, that I do need to say that I'm actually very much in BBSSE mode when I think about writing grants. Um, MRC is slightly different, but it's familiar enough. NIHR is, you know, it's a bit like speaking a slightly different language. Um, and it, it, it will vary. So, again, that's a caveat. I mean, if you write an NIH, NIH proposal, I think that's very much different from BBSLC. So you have to be careful uh, in, in, in looking at this. Now, it might be fairly obvious to you, but let's just go through why, why should you bother to write grants, you know? You've got that salary coming into your, uh, your bank account each month, you know, you can just sit around and look out the window, can't you? Or, you know, and have a nice cup of coffee with your mates. Well, these are the reasons. So, First thing is it allows you to employ experienced staff. So if you scrabble around just getting studentships, you know, you have to spend a lot of time training those students, a lot of hands-on time in the lab, <coughs> placing all the orders, getting everything in place, and you're looking after them. Um, and you get trapped in this situation where you don't have enough time to even think strategically and so forth. If you get grants, you've got funding typically for three to five years, which means you've got continuity. So Another thing that people sometimes do is they rely on project students. You know, project student comes in for three months and do a load of stuff, and then another one comes six months later, stop start. If you've got postdoc in your lab for three years, then you can get stuff done. You're more likely to get referable papers, better quality research if you've got postdocs around. Your grants will pay for reagents, um, and having a well-founded, well-funded lab means that you. You're also in a good position to grab opportunities when they come. So if you've got a bit of money around um, and someone says, oh, look, could you just sequence this genome for me? So in my case, it kind of worked with, or oh, just do this. Um, you know, you'll get 
a great paper out of it, you can say, oh, it's only going to cost a thousand pounds or two thousand pounds. You can find the money for it usually within the grants. Um, I'll say more about that kind of issue later. You can get uh, equipment in your lab, um, and the equipment stays in your lab once the grant's over. They don't take it back. So if you can get if you can get the right kind of equipment, you can uh, hold on to it, and it starts to build this well-founded lab for you, a good setup. Uh, and you can use that equipment for other purposes. So although, say, you, you buy a PCR machine for one particular grant for one thing, it's a general purpose mach machine. You can use it, and it adds to your uh, repertoire of, of skills that you can do. And also, you can pay for travel on grants. So if you want to go to conferences, and you want to get out of your office a bit, um, and you want to find out what's going on in your field, it's much easier if you've got your own grant funding with a travel budget there. There are all sorts of little bursaries and little bits of money around that you can apply for and fill in loads of paper and get. But if you've just got the money on your grant, then you're okay. Now, this is showing my age. and Probably many of you don't remember this guy, loads of money, uh, back in the late 80s, one of Harry Enfield's characters, um, where he used to just go on about dosh all the time. Um, but one of the reasons for being a loads of money in the lab, of actually having grant funding, uh, is, is that you get respect. Um, you persuaded uh, referees and a panel of experts to give you money. And so that is a mark of esteem, if you like. And that's a win-win situation for you and for your school or college or university or whatever. Um, so it's a good thing if you write grant proposals for all concerned, you get them. Um, also, the overheads sometimes trickle down through the institution. So some places, I don't think we do it here, but in some places you might get like a thousand or two thousand pounds for every grant that goes into an account that you can use creatively for whatever you like. We don't do that, do we? No, not a worry, but other places do. Now, of course, having grants gives you leverage. And this is where I'm talking about from the, from the shop floor point of view rather than the management point of view. So obviously you, if you've got grant money, you can say, well, I, I don't like it here, you, you're pissing me about, I don't like the, the, the regime you're implying on, on top of me, I can take my money elsewhere. So you can say, oh, I've got five million in the, in the grant funding, I'm going to Birmingham because I'm fed up with, with what you're telling me here, or I'm going somewhere else. So you can do that, and you can, you, so it gives you leverage against the powers that be above you. And it keeps them responsive to your needs. Um, so, it, you know, there was one guy when I was in Birmingham who, you know, about half the grant money for the whole school of biosciences. And if he just even had a, even the slightest frown, you know, people were worrying, oh, oh, what does he want? What do we do? How can we keep him? It keep, it, it obviously, uh, more, in more concrete terms, it stops them dumping on you. So, you know, it's an unwritten rule. If you haven't got much grant money, they'll ask you to be the admissions tutor, or they'll ask you to be the health and safety rep, or something like that. If you've got loads of grant money, you can say, oh, I've got all this grant money, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a research thoroughbred, get off my shoulders. They will, if you've got the, the grant money to, to prove it. I'm speaking plainly here, you know, the management will probably tell me off, but this is the way it works. Uh, I'll put this as just one last thought there. You can actually stop sacking you as well, if you've got grant money. Um, I didn't put that in the last time I... Um, gave this talk because I had never actually come across that, but now we have come across that, it's worth saying that, yeah, if you want to protect your job, then you've got to get grant money in. So, what about laying the groundwork for getting your grant funding in the first place? Well, first thing is you've got to cultivate good karma out there in your community, in your research community. So what you want is all of your peers out there, or your colleagues here, to all have this nice feeling about you, that you're a jolly good person in Cambridge. Um, and one of the things you can do is exploit the halo effect. So if you can get people out there to think you're a jolly good person, for some reason completely unrelated to your grant, to the project you're doing, it just is a matter of psychology that bleeds across in their thinking about you. So say, say you organised a, um, a session at a, a, a symposium, that was very well organised, and you were on the stage introducing people. Everyone knows who you are. They would say, oh, that person's a jolly good person, whatever. That kind of helps creating this halo around you when you're actually um, then 
putting your stuff out for, for them to review it or to look at it in other ways. Being more blunt, piss in the right places, you know. Get, get your mark out there so that people know who you are in your field and that you're actually visible. So get out and mix a bit. If you go to conferences, go to the conference, uh, but also maybe go to the bar in the evenings and, and spend some time talking to people and introducing yourselves to other people in the field. You've got to maintain visibility, so even if you haven't had any papers out, you can write a review article in your field to establish that you kind of know what the subject's about and what area's about and, and just get something out. And the other thing you can do these days in the last few years has become much more prominent is you can cultivate your online presence. So if you're on Twitter and YouTube and so forth, you can sell yourself as a personal brand and get that uh, recognition. The point being that when if someone comes across your grant and it's got your, you know, it, it, it's got your name on it and they know who you are, they're just going to approach it slightly differently, subtly differently than if you're just completely unknown to them. Um, it will just give you that, if you do it right, it will give you the edge. Obviously, if you're the kind of person that pisses everyone off and up the wrong way, it might work against you if they know who you are. But um, most of the time, if you can get it, so you're cultivating that good karma rather than bad karma, things will work out for you. Okay, then you've got to choose the right funding body and scheme. Uh, fun each of the funders has its own website and it tells you all in detail about the schemes that they have. We mentioned the research professional, which you can go to, and that will give you in, uh, insights, uh, intelligence into what uh, funding is coming up, what new calls for proposals, and so forth. And you just have to find the scheme and the panel that fits what you want. Now, one of the things I've learned is that if you're actually responding to a call for proposals, that generally gives you a better chance. Um, so if there's a call for new projects in synthetic biology as, a pro, uh, as applied to um, I don't know, development of new methods for debriding wounds or something, you know, very specific thing like that, and you go, oh yeah, I can do that, then you're much more likely to get funding than if you just put in your ideas, uh, as, as we call it, in responsive mode to the panel. So that's an important thing. So that's why it is worth keeping your, your, your ear to the ground in terms of these kind of calls coming up. So for example, there was one, this MRC bid for uh, infrastructure investment in uh, medical uh, bioinformatics was one I thought, well, okay, I could do that. I, I, con I contacted them and said, by medical bioinformatics, you realize that micro microbes actually are of medical importance, so it could be medical microbial bioinformatics. And I said, yeah, okay. Uh, and then that was where it kind of in. Um, now this is where we get close to the shadow line. If you're going to go to a particular panel, put your grant in, it's a good idea to go and look who's on that panel. Find out who they are. Um, and the best thing is if you can find a panel where you've got a couple of mates, two, three, four mates, who you know, you've had drinks with, or they think you're a good person, you think they're a good person, but you have no evidence of a conflict of interest that can be discerned in the public domain. So you've not written a paper with them recently or co been, been a co-investigator on a grant with them recently. Those are the people you want. I put no evidence of. Obviously, you know, this is that channel. Like, is there, if, if you were the best man at so-and-so's wedding, does that make a conflict of interest? Well, if you've never written a paper, if someone goes to PubMed and doesn't find you've ever written a paper, there's no evidence you've written a grant. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. The thing is that when the it gets to the panel, the panel members can declare, say, well, I know this guy, I was the best man at the wedding, but we never collaborated uh, in anything in terms of research. Then the, then the chairman of the panel can say, well, okay, uh, we'll let you off. Sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's an important thing there. Um, and if, if we were to go a little bit further, you might like to think about going to those panels, working out who those people are that like to introduce your stuff. Maybe invite them to give a seminar to your research unit or whatever, so that they know who you are. You, know, you can kind of manipulate the system so that you get these people to know who you are and have a warm glow of, of, about you, you know, feeling about you. One of the problems that you also get is that you might be wanting to work in, in, in a new area, 
um, working on something that you've worked on, but um, you want to use new technologies or you want to come at it from a different angle. And in that situation, you need to get co uh, co-applicants and collaborators in to, to uh, mitigate any risks, to bring in a track record that you yourself don't have. Um, so that, that's, that's a, a key point. And I've used that several times. Where so that's, I, I used to work on a secretion system called type 3 secretion in E. coli. Uh, but I had no track record in kind of gene regulation, so I co-opted in um, a colleague, Steve Busby, who was world expert on gene regulation in E. coli, and I said, oh, come on, you can help us study gene regulation in this particular system. And basically that meant that, okay, they could say, well, this guy doesn't know much about gene regulation, he knows a lot about type 3 secretion, but Steve Busby's a world expert, tick, fine, take it down the street. And in fact, this is part of what you might call the Paul Nurse effect. Uh, if you can get someone like Paul Nurse, on your grant as a co-investigator or a collaborator, and then people reading it will just, oh yeah, where's Paul Nurse is on his phone, you know, SRS, Nobel laureates, anyone like that. Um, and it does work. Some of these, you know, I, I've, I've seen a, a, this happen though, where some, I, someone I know who's an FRS used to just allow his name to go forward as a collaborator on lots of grants. And people got wise, so people on the panel could say, he says he's involved in every project going, but we know he's not. It's, and and, and yeah, it becomes a debased kind of. So you have to be careful about that. Um, but it is a trick you can use. Another thing I've done is that you can work with an overseas collaborator. So if um, you're working on, in, on I don't know, starvation stress in Haemophilus influenzae, like this lady here, and then she finds someone in America who's also working on that. And they work together and they get on well then when you apply for a BVSRC grant here or an MRC grant here, you can scoop up all the work that you've been doing together and bulk up your preliminary data to get your grant. And your colleague in the US can then take all your stuff and shove it into his NSF proposal as preliminary work. Um, and that way you can sort of you know, win, get synergy with each other um, and use each other's track records. Because the thing is, you're not, the point here being, you're not able to apply for funding, the same funding, because you're in completely different domains, you know, UK and um, America, or probably the UK and Australia, for example, would be another example, where, you know, you can't be in competition, so you might as well collaborate. Okay, so in terms of laying the groundwork, we get stuck into it, should get in the grant in a minute, but let's lay in the groundwork. You've got to learn to think and write well. Uh, I think that's a, you know, a prerequisite. You actually have to have your ideas clear and be able to think logically. Um, and a grant is not Moby Dick. Does anyone know why I say that? Anyone read Moby Dick? And what do you think about Moby Dick? It's a long book. It's kind of ponderous. Highlights and then a lot of stuff in between. Well, the thing that I'm thinking of is that he, when he started it, he didn't know where he went. You know, it's just like stream of consciousness just goes, you don't, you don't write a grant like that. You have to think about, you know, strict hierarchical outline in your head. Right, point one, point two, point three, point one, point one, point one, point two, point one, and so on. You have to get all that clear, the structure of your reasoning clear before you actually start writing the larger uh, full-length grant. Because if, if, if you just start writing and then you wander all over the page and you're bringing a bit of this here, a bit of that there, and then you know, it, it just it, it doesn't work so well. And in a way, it's kind of this elevator sales pitch. You've got to you've got to get your points across quickly. Okay, so what's your grant going to be about? It's going to be about point one is this, point two is that, point three is that, and you, and you can articulate it quickly. The other thing, when I say sales pitch, now some of you might be under the misapprehension that it's the job of the reviewers and of the panel to read what you say really, really carefully and work at it until they understand everything you've written. So if, any, if anything you've written is a bit unclear, well, they have to work at it. But still, you know, that's their job, isn't it? That's utter rubbish and politics. Basically, it's your job to persuade them that what you have to say is interesting, novel, feasible, original, and so forth. And you have to get your message across. You're in a competitive environment here. It's not their job 
to pour over what you say and try and work out what it you know, like trying to read Finnegan's Wake or something. They're not interested in that. They they want to just get what's it going on here? What what's the sales pitch? And the key point is to try it out on the colleagues. And, and the best colleague is, is someone who is not quite an expert in your field, but is clear, close enough that they can understand what you're trying to say, but not so you know, close that they're already embroiled in it. Um, that's a hangover from another talk, actually. Published regularly, but not too much. I, I try and get about eight to ten papers a year. The key point is that you, you should also, in laying the groundwork for your grant, if you can say, oh, I had a paper in a four-star journal, you know, four-star paper, or I had a paper in a, in a high-impact journal, that makes it a lot easier to get your grant than if you've got five papers in low-impact journals. Um, that's, that's, again, my interpretation. Some people might disagree with that, but that's the way I see it. What are you going to work on? The other thing is, what's the point in working on small projects and little things? You can argue that there are some little things that need doing, but... If you're trying to get started, you've got to start thinking strategically and work on a big canvas. And, and one of the things that, that grants get damned for is that this is just incrementalism. All right, they already, they already clone 100 of these genes and they want to clone another 12. You know, so what? But they've already characterized 50 out of membrane proteins and they want to work on the, the remaining five. Or Those kind of things don't really hack it, really, when you're in this competitive environment. It's quite hard to get them across. Now, we can argue in an absolute sense, well, that, does that mean all of that stuff is not worth doing? And, and I'm not trying to get into that. I'm just saying in terms of if you want to get your grant through with the most uh, chance of success, and particularly if you're starting out and this is your first one or two grants, that's the thing you should be looking for. So here's a little, yeah. Charles Darwin trying to write a grant proposal in, say, 18, the 1840s or 1850s, you know, research objective, explain all life on Earth, time scale, 20 to 30 years track record knows a little bit about geology. Um, you know, that's perhaps going a bit far. You know, Darwin did succeed, but he was a gentleman scientist. He didn't have to write graphs yet, he's done these. Um, but having um, a, a strategic vision is good. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is science, I think it's Peter Medawar said, science of the art of the soluble. Actually trying to find things that you can actually get an answer to and it actually will work and going around obstacles is a good way forward as well. And ideally, you want to blend risky and, and e risky work with easy wins. So if everything is very straightforward, people will say, this is boring. This is, you know, there needs to be some risk, some capacity to surprise in what you're doing, uh, on the one hand. But if you, everything is speculative, then people will say, well, you know, this is all just a dream, a pipe dream, and blue skies, and whatever. And unfortunately, panels tend to, to be more like the latter. They tend to say, ah, oh, this is all too speculative. Um, and, 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 and so you have, to, you have to get that blend right, really, of risky versus easy wins. And the other thing is that you have to have come away from the end of the grant by saying that you've said something notable about the natural world. So there's a temptation to say, well, I, I've got, I don't know, I've I, I just got a new instrument or a new technology. I just want to try it out on something. I, I'd, I'd like to use Oxford Nanopore to sequence someone's <coughs> ear. Um, you know, well, it's, it's methodological. You're not really saying anything about, you're just showing that you can use a new technology. Those kind of grants are a bit harder to sell. They're not necessarily impossible, but um, it's better if you can frame it to say, we're going to use this new technology and we're going to answer questions that we couldn't answer with the previous technologies. Um, and, and actually, you know, it's like showing it's superior rather than pure, purely non inferior sort of thing. Um, the other thing that you need to get clear is this is not a deterministic game. It's not like a game of chess where you know it just depends on your skill moving the pieces and, and and that's it. It's a game of chance and it's much more like backgammon. Okay, you can you can be good at backgammon and you can you can win most of your games against novices and so forth and, and whatever. But there's always the throw of the dice and, and there's always that element of luck. And so you can put in a pr pr proposal to go to a panel in January, and it turns out that's a really hard panel, because they had 120 <coughs> grants go to that one. You put it in in May, knowing that maybe only 60 grants. And so, you know, it just depends on the competition. It depends on subjectivity of the panel, the moods. You know, if, some, if the person who's you're introducing members just had an argument with their wife or their husband, that, 
that morning as they left the house, they're not and they're going to be a grumpy old bastard. They're not going to be so nice. They're not going to fight for you. Uh, on the other hand, if they've you know they <coughs> uh, just bought a new car and they enjoy driving to the driving, you know, all those things come into it. And the group dynamics of the panels are unpredictable. As I say, if you put in a, a proposal in in January and then you put it in in, in May. There's no guarantee you get the same answer, even if, the, even if there was the same number of grants going in. Because on one day someone will pipe up, oh, I like that particular part of it. And the other time they might be thinking about their dinner and don't make that point, and the conversation goes in a different direction. But the point is to get on these panels and serve yourself, because I think there's no, um, there's no substitute for having done it a few times. You don't have to do it very many times. Maybe if you only sit on two or three panels, you get the, you get the gist of it, and you realise that it's not... Um, it's not that your grant has to be bad to fail. It just has to be something more competitive out there. So, I mean, with the BBSLC, it, it's about 20%, 50, 20% generally. Sometimes it goes up as high as 25%, I think, um, of the grants get funded. Um, and so, you know, probably at least 50% of the grants going forward to the panel are fundable in the sense there's no fundamental flaw, the science is good, it's all kind of worth, kind of worth doing, but they're just not competitive enough. So this is an interesting question, how many grant proposals do you have to write to get one? And we used this as a, I used this as when I was interviewing applicants for some Birmingham fellowships uh, when it was at the University of Birmingham, I, I put this point, because they all wrote this, they, they had, to, had to write a five-year plan for their fellowship, and they said, at the end of year one, I'll have my first grant. At the end of year two, I'll have my second grant. I said, well, how many grants do you have to write then to get your first grant at the end of year one? Um, and then, you know, you can tangle them up and say, well, so what do you think the success rate is with a BBSLC? And some of them would say, oh, it's 20%, so I've got to write five. The clever ones would say, well, the average is 20%, but I'm a lot smarter than the average. I think I might have to write two to get one. Um, there was a colleague of mine who's now a very famous, well, very eminent professor at the University of Birmingham, I recruited him about 10, 15 years ago, and in his first year he wrote 17 proposals, uh, a kind of level of energy which I don't think I've seen anyone else uh, to, get, to get funded. Um. Now, let's talk about life history strategies. How many children are you going to have? Are you going to be like a mouse or are you going to be like an elephant? So a mouse will have... I don't know what it is, 12, 13 in a litter? Six At six to eight, but how many litters will the average mouse have? Huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they'll just spray the, you know, it's like Monty Python and that sketch about cat. They're just, the babies are coming out while you're doing the washing. Um, is that the right approach? Well, why does the mouse do that? Well, the mouse does that because it knows if it produces 16. Uh, infant mice, that 15 of them will be dead within the first year. It's an unpredictable environment, um, and life history researchers call this, what well, they used to call it the R reproductive strategy. I'm not up to date with the field enough to know whether they still think that way, but that, it, it basically, because you've got this very unpredictable environment, and there's a lot of luck involved, it makes sense to treat it as a lottery and buy more and more tickets. Um, and that is one view. And it's a view which I think has got some cogency. Now you've heard the view is that the research councils don't like this because obviously you, they don't want to be kind of carpet bombed with your proposals. Um, and they have managed to persuade the VC to tell us not to do this. But obviously it's in their interest not to be carpet bombed, but it's not in your interest. It's your interest to get the bloody first grant, or the second grant, or as many grants as you can. And you've got to look at it from the different points of view here. One thing that you can do here is, if you're trying to write multiple grants, you can, you can clone grants. So I had a situation where the BBSLC announced that they wanted to have um, grants, largest grants, on um, exploiting the genome sequences. And one group from the E. coli community said, oh, can you just set up a database for us? Uh, I said, yeah, so we just want a page of A4 to bung in this thing, and I said, yeah, all right. So I did that, and then the next week someone from Salmonella said, oh, can you do this for Salmonella? So I just took exactly the same 
words, and I just we did find and replace in code like a salmonella. Uh, and in Campylobacter. In fact, I did it for three, and two of them got funded. Um, so, you know, for, for an additional 10 minutes' work, I got a postdoc. So, there are many areas where you can do that. Um, you know, we want to look at the proteome of E. coli. Well, we want to look at the proteome of Salmonella. And you know, all the points you make would be the same. You can write the same grant. And you, can, the, the, you know, the, the subject matter is different enough that they're not the same grant. But you can make, uh, you know, you can use minimal effort to actually get multiple grants at the same kind of ideas. What about the elephant? Well, the, why does the elephant spend 18 months gestating a single infant? Well, it has the luxury of doing that because its environment is very stable. It's kind of predictable. It's going to be the same from year to year. And also because it is so big and at the top of the kind of the apex in terms of, of body size and, and defense, it's not going to have the same problem as the mouse. And, and this is obviously, the strategy here is to concentrate on having infrequent but very high quality. <coughs> and this is what the funders want, as I said, this is what the BBSC would tell you you should be doing, this is what the university officially says you should be doing. Um, and um, there is some good in it. Um, and I think that, I don't think there's an absolute rule here. This is a sliding scale. It's not, it's not like either or. It's a spectrum between them. And you, you just need to give some thought as to what way you're going to approach this. Um, there is a threshold. So even if you go for the lottery approach and say, I'm going to write two grants. Well, I'm going to write one grant, say, for every panel. So three grants a year. I'm going to write three grant proposals a year. There's no point in just writing three rubbish proposals. Because you can't get above the threshold of actually writing a proposal that isn't that has got a chance of being fundable, then there's no point in doing it. There's no point in just keep, keep doing that. Um, and that's where it is, I think it is appropriate that you have <coughs> internal review processes and you give some thought to, to, to checking out that what you're doing is good enough before you, you shove it in. But it's, it's all a matter of balance. And, and sometimes when I listen to what the university research council is telling us, even though actually politically I'm at left of centre, I start to feel myself turning into one of these Tea Party Republicans at the dead hand of government and stopping us from doing anything because they're saying, well, you can't do this until you've, you've had it peer reviewed by 15 people, one of whom must be an FRS, and, uh, and you have to give us at least uh, 150 days notice and uh, you must fill in everything. You know, there is a balance there, um, and I think um, my feeling is that the balance should be we should actually get on and write more proposals um, and it's in our interest to write more proposals um, and if the research councils want us to write fewer proposals then they have to find other ways rather than just asking us nicely you know if they if they charged us for each proposal that went in that might incentivize mine but at the moment they don't do that the other point here is that ratio of effort to reward does not stay linear so if you write a little proposal to get a little pot of money for £15,000, this is an extra slide I put in this morning on the, because I just thought about it so I was sitting down. That doesn't mean that it takes a twentieth of the effort than it would do to write a project grant for £300,000. Not like half the effort, but it won't be certainly not a twentieth of the effort. Um, and I quite like this Jewish word, chutzpah. It basically, actually just try in your hand. Write a proposal, get it off, and do it. Um, go for that project grant proposal, even though you're not quite ready. Um, and I, I, I used to say this a lot when I was in Belfast, where people used to just write lots of little things to local charities to get a PhD student. So, you know, the standard quantum of effort should be to get a project grant. Uh, get a postdoc, and then you're liberated from all the day-to-day -day mucking about in the lab ordering things and whatever. <coughs> you could go beyond um, a project grant and you can go up to uh, program grants and, and other large grants and they're not necessarily harder to get. You know, the effort involved in asking for three million is not ten times more effort than it is to ask for a project grant. There are some caveats there. Um, it's best if you're dealing with people you can get, get on with and they get on with each other. If someone says the University of Warwick must put in an NHR proposal on uh, the safety of crossing the road. And we need someone from um, 
economics and someone from ethics and you and you can coordinate and nobody knows each other and they all got pointing in different directions those kind of grants are a real pain and they probably won't um, you know set, like the old herding cats issue basically even a large proposal it's best to have one authorial voice where it's written as a kind of coherent piece um, and you know you can see the staple marks between investigator one says this kind of thing and then suddenly it all changes and investigator two says a completely different narrative and invest those kind of grants are not like to get funded. Uh, and I've seen those kind of things in the past uh, several times. And in fact, the two Lolas that I was involved in, Birmingham failed partly for these reasons. Um, okay. You're all very inert. I'm gonna, someone must give me some feedback because I don't want to just have a monologue. Has anyone got any points? Anyone surprised by what I've said? Anyone outraged? By the fact that I'm saying these things. You haven't told me that. You want to tell me that? Not yet. I pointed out it's a matter of degree as to how much risk you take and, and all those kind of things. So, so I, I'm not going to just talk for an hour. Let's, someone give me an example of the kind of things I've said from their own experiences. Alex, have you got anything? Um, I've had a bit of an unsuccessful mission grant and I just Say anything against what I've said? Yes, I, I, I completely agree. So I, I'm a, a coordinator at the European Consortium, and uh, uh, I, it's not the first one. I coordinated in the past, and uh, at the beginning, uh, to enter in the EU market, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you need to have uh, collaborators. So nobody wanted to collaborate with me because I was unknown. Mm -hmm. So I decided to, uh, to coordinate myself and look for the partners. And then uh, it, it got funded. Okay, I wrote the whole proposal myself, so it's to avoid the stuff on the uh, effect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then when you are coordinator and you tell the, uh, someone, do you want money? you want uh, half a million? Yeah. Well, you two pages by next week. Mm -hmm. and half yeah, you get, then that's what you say, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the chutzpah point, well, as a former head of a school, not far from here, it's an enormous chutzpah recently, you've got how many million? How did you get? Is synthetic biology? 12 million. 12 million. Yeah. It's eye-watering amounts of money, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of people who just feel, oh, I can't ask for that. And we had exactly the same feelings when we were like 8.4 million. I can't ask for that. Well, why not? Um, in fact, there, there was another one where there was a particular call from the BBSRC, and we looked at what they'd funded in the past, and everything they'd funded was 400, 500, 600,000. And we said, well, we want two postdocs for five years, and we can't fit within those budgets. Is that just that nobody asked for that much money before, or is it that there is a kind of glass ceiling? And we asked around, and people said, no, we haven't asked, we didn't justify it. So we put in 1.2 million and got it. So you have to have that kind of hooks funny, just get on and do it. Okay, so that's, that's some of the preamble. Let's get on to the actual mechanics of it. So you have to look over the online forms, you know, it's, it's just like when students are supposed to read the exam question and answer the question that they're supposed to answer. It's the same thing, you look at the forms and you read the instructions and you do what they ask you to do. They tell you to write it in Arial 12 font, there's no point in writing it in some other font because they'll get cross. I mean, they might allow it through, but it's just, you know. There's sometimes wiggle room on, on these kind of things. Um, one old trick that we used to do is that you can adjust the line spacing and the character spacing of a word. You can make it like 0.8, just about. So you, you know, you write your proposal, you've got six pages, but you can't get it for six pages. So it's six pages in one paragraph, and then you fiddle with those things, suddenly magically it all goes in six pages. Mm -hmm. There are things you can do like that, but you're best off just doing what they say, fulfilling their criteria. Uh, in a different kind of domain, when I've been examining in PhD theses and I didn't like the thesis, I got the ruler out and just 
established that the, the student had to comply with the regulations about margin size. So I could immediately say this thesis shouldn't have ever come put to me because it's margin wrong. Um, you know, pe people on the other side of the table can get mixed in like that. Liaise with the grants officer. So, you know, there are people at the research councils and other funding bodies who you can talk to, human beings at the other end of the phone. And you can say, okay, I want to, I want to work on um, the Human Safety Act, um, traffic junctions. Does this fall within the remit of the MRC or should I ever go into another research council or whatever? And they will tell you, yeah, this is it's fine. I mean, that's what happened, as I say, with our MRC one. I said, well, you say MRC medical bioinformatics, but you know there are more bacteria than human cells associated with people. Uh, you know, bacteria haven't gone away, the infections are important. And they said, yeah, fine. That's within our remit. We can put you proposal. Um, the other point to remember here, not just for the people at the research council, but even in RSS as well, they are humans. You're not to treat them, you don't treat them as serfs <coughs> or you know, people that you can just shout at or get cross with or, or, or ask, um, you know, make snide comments to, because they're human too. And they have the ability to do, to help you, to do the job that they're doing for you smoothly and efficiently. Or they'll find ways, you know, like the old those that program in America where people phone up with confessions and a guy worked for McDonald's said that whenever a policeman came in, he used to spit in the burger before he gave it to him. They can do a spit in the burger thing to make things hard for them. We don't do that. You don't do that. No, you're far too nice. But the people at the research council. In fact, there, there is a person here who used to work at a research council. Um, and she got the nickname Schadenfreude when she worked at the research council because she used to tell people, They'd phone up and say, oh, can I put in a 100-page appendix, appendix to my proposal? He'd say, no, don't do that. And we'll get cross and they won't read it. But people used to do it. And then when they kind of got cross and didn't read it, and went through the grant actions, they had great pleasure from the fact that she told them not to do that. You know, so they're, they're human beings, and they have normal human emotions. So you have to remember that. OK, so now you've got to get down and write a proposal. You have to concentrate. Bunk off all those meetings. You don't have to go to the meeting to discuss what colour the toilet should be painted or, or stuff like that. You know, just anything that's not important. In fact, almost anything. Just chuck it out of your diary and get on and write it. Don't open a post. Pull the phone out the wall. Don't, don't answer the phone. That can distract you. Turn off email and Twitter. These are just distractors. And just concentrate single-heartedly, uh, wholeheartedly on that grant proposal. And actually be grumpy with people. Say, sorry, I can't talk to you. Esther will say that we'll see why I had to put the brackets on because she knows I'm, my default is grumpy git. But some of you might not, Esther won't find it easy to be a grumpy git. She has to, when she's writing proposals, she has to say, Look, go away, I can't talk to you now, I'm writing this proposal, uh, and whatever. One thing that you can do is you can work at home. It's kind of one of those ironies <coughs> that we all say, oh, I must, I'm an important academic, I must have an office. And then you find the most productive places to work at home. Uh, but that is one of the ironies that you, basically at home you're not going to get interrupted by all these people knocking on your door. You're not going to be tempted to go to the canteen and spend an hour and a half having lunch with your colleagues uh, and so forth. The only caveat there is obviously if you've got preschool kids or this week if you've got any kids at all because uh, it's half term, they will be at home annoying you. Um, and you just got to force yourself to get on and do it. So, so you know, um, there, there is actually. Um, a method that one of my colleagues described as the Pomodoro method, which is basically you, you sit down and you get a, a, one of those Pomodoro clock things, that, you know, stopwatch things that you can use for cooking, and you just put it to, say, 45 minutes, and you're going to work for 45 minutes or an hour without interruption. And then when the alarm goes off, you can get up, stretch your feet, have a cup of coffee or whatever. But you, you keep your focus during those periods. So, anything there anyone wants to pick up on? Anyone had trouble writing grants and concentrating? No. Same things apply to writing a thesis, for example, for PhD students. You know, it's got to, it's time management and, and focusing. Anyone watch Coronation Street? Don't take your son's written. That's, you know. You might, you might want to cross the shadow line that far, but that's going too far. Right, um, okay, writing the proposal, case for support one. So you start off, this is a BBSC grant, you've got to put in the people, place, state, release. You've got to establish your, your credentials here. So your track record, reputation. It should be evidence-based. 
So you should say, I am a world expert in the, the biology of ingrown toenails, as evidenced by high impact factor on ingrown toenails in the ingrown medicine, or whatever. Don't just say, I'm good at what I do, I'm great. I mean, it's resume over there. I'm, a, I, I'm really task focused and really oriented. I'm a people person. It's all just blah. You have to, you make those statements, you have to evidence them with something. Um, you know, run a highly successful research group with a umpteen million pounds of income over the last five years or whatever. Um, you should have, as we mentioned before, you should be getting brand name recognition anyway, but you hope that the person, that most of the people who are reading this will have heard of you before, um, rather than you being completely unknown. And that's where you need to cultivate the visibility. If the, the other thing that people will say, well, okay, you're, you're, you're really good at what you do, you're Nobel laureate, but you're working in the University of Scunthorpe, um, or the equivalent, uh, and uh, so then you have to establish, well, actually, the University of Scunthorpe has invested £12 million in my discipline and whatever, whatever, whatever. And you have to mention all those things that, that make it a conducive environment. Now, you might think, this is obvious, isn't it? Everyone, but here in the University of Warwick, oh, we're in the top ten, everyone knows how great we are. There's no harm in actually saying, you know, I came here five, uh, a year ago and I got a startup fund of twenty million pounds to establish my own laboratory, or twenty pounds to establish my own laboratory, whatever it was. Um, and you know, mention all those things. Um, data release. They, they put in this new thing that you have to put data release and make reagents and info public. Often, with grants, you can actually borrow text from other grants. So someone's found a nice way to say that you're making all data available. Just go and steal the words from their grant. Um, there's at least you know, a lot of these things uh, you can... And, and I, I've suggested in the past, I don't think anyone's ever taken me up on this, is that we should actually have a, a database of previous successful grants that anyone can look at. And then you can go in there and say, okay, someone's written a grant on proteomics before, just add the right exact words to describe how we're going to release this data, I'll just steal it. And you save yourself 20 minutes, half an hour, instead of having to think it up, you just put those words in. Um. Right, case for support two in a BBSSC grant is the actual case for the work. Um, so you have to address the criteria here used by the referees and the panel. Those are actually, if you go to the BBSSC website, it'll be the same and others, they'll tell you what kinds of things they're looking for. They're looking for things like originality, but nobody's done this before. One of the things I do if I'm reviewing a grant, I'll do a PubMed search to see if someone's already done it. Um, and if they haven't, say, well, someone's already done this research, throw it out. And you, you, know, you don't have to read the rest of it, you just chuck it in the bin, save yourself time to review it. Um, and the problem is, of course, that when the person writes the grant, they write the grant in January, the reviewer sees it in April, someone's already published a great paper on that in February, and taken all you know, the credibility away from the research. So, you know, you have to expect the reviewers to, to do those kind of things. You can't pull the wool over their eyes and say, ah, oh, well, my competitor in France has already done this, but nobody will know. They won't bother to read nature and see that he's already done it. Um, you know, don't, don't be naive like that. They will find you out. Actually mentioning that, though, there is, a, there is a sweet place where you can go, which is if you get scooped after they've given you the money, like, you know, I want £300,000 to to clone the, the gene that um, makes people have dimples, and then someone else is, just, just as they've given me the award letter, someone else has just done that, effectively then you've got £300,000 to do what you like with. Because you know, they've given you the money, someone's already achieved it, you can then just go and say, well, all right, we won't do dimples, we'll do something else. Yeah. So that it's not always a bad thing to be scooped, uh, but it's a bad thing to be scooped between the time you submit the grant and the time they read it. Timeliness and promise, these are the other things. Strategic relevance, um, and so if you have to look at the, look at the strategic um, <coughs> priorities that the research councils put down, um, and they'll say food security or whatever they are. I can't remember what they are. But again, you have to be pragmatic because this is what some committee of the great and the good, the BBSC, the MRC, or whatever have said in public and written down and they've kind of said it with the idea that the minister will give them loads of money for this. But the people who read your grants will actually be like you, they'll be scientists. And if you do something that's elegant and wonderful um, and exciting, 
it doesn't quite fit their thing, then you, you may still get it through. So you mustn't get too much of a slave to that. Definitely you must try as much as you can to buff up the front end so it looks as if it's strategically relevant. I mean, and we're very creative people as scientists. If your government says synthetic biology, you've got to give money to synthetic biology. So I don't know what. Well, I do synthetic biology. You know, I clone a few genes and whatever. That, you know, just make it up for synthetic biology. But it, it, you can do that. I'm, I'm sure you must have seen lots of synthetic biology grants that could have been funded five years ago that they've just changed the front end. I mean, this is what happens, and you have to do it. Impact on health and wealth. So if you can actually do the shroud-raising thing, say, oh, well, you know, Campylobacter is a disease that, that infects half a million people and in the UK every year, and, and hundreds of them get Guillain Barry or something, and, and they require hundreds of weeks in the intensive care unit, blah, blah, blah. You know, if you can actually be concrete, rather than just saying, oh, Campylobacter is an established pathogen or something like that, it's much more um, convincing. Um, if you can get money, figures for money, you know, it costs the UK economy, you know, irritable bowel syndrome costs the UK economy £12 billion pounds a year or something. If you can make some statement like that, it's much more impactful than if you just say it's an important disease. How are we doing? Oh, got to get a bit of a move on. Um, so when you write in the background to the, res to the research, to the work you're proposing to do, you don't have much space. And I think one of the, if, you, if, if your background is taking up more space than anything else, and the actual work you propose to do is, is a smaller part, then you, you kind of start thinking, well, maybe you've got it wrong. You certainly don't have to have uh, an encyclopedic knowledge, a general review of the whole literature of the field. That's not what you're there to do. You're there to persuade the person reading it, that you have something new and original to say in this area. So you don't have to cover the whole you know, DNA, was, the structure of DNA was first described by Crick and Watson, blah, Sanger invented sequencing, blah, 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 blah. You know, you don't need that. You, you just have to get to the, to the point. Now, here's a little trick. Think about who's going to be reading it. Who's going to be on that panel? Who's going to be your or likely review? Cite their work in your introduction. You know, that this, the, the case that, um, I don't know what, you know, that, that such and such is the important cause of this disease was established by John Smith um, in seminal work in, in, in 1984 or whatever. You know, you, if you say that, you're massaging their egos. Um, if you don't cite it and they read it and they think they're important, then you're sunk. They say, oh, this person has done a proper literature review. Um, you know, it's all ego, but they'll, they'll, they'll couch it in more objective terms. Or they have, obviously haven't read the literature because they haven't cited me. Um, stress your achievements. Um, get pilot work and proof of principle uh, experiments in there, useful to establish feasibility. Now, there's a, again, this is a spectrum. There's not a, an absolute rule. Some people will tell you that you can't get money for work unless you've already done it. So the only way you can prove that what you're proposing is feasible is you've already done it. And you tell, you tell them that you've done two-thirds of it and you want the last third of it. You know, crystallographers, you know, by the time they've got some crystals, they've ne nearly got a structure. If they say, oh, I want to crystallize this protein, and people say, well, you've got crystals, you've no idea. So, you, know, you can be in this catch too. And um, So if you have got um, some preliminary work, that does hold you in good stead. And particularly, say, say you want, I wish to clone 100 genes, I want to investigate I don't know, 50 new small RNAs and their role in, in, in um, arcanobacteria, virulence or whatever, then if you've actually got three or five already that you've characterised and worked on, and then you say, right, now I want to do 95 using the same approaches, that's much more credible than just saying, I want to do 100 and I've never done anything. Um, so so that's, that, it is important that you get uh, that kind of work. But it's not, it's not an absolute thing. Sometimes if your ideas are cogent enough and you have the track record in the field, um, then people will say, well, she's not done this before, she's not done that before, but they obviously can. They've got the track record, they've got the right collaborators, it will work. And you don't, I, I've had it where I've put in proposals where I haven't had any pilot work at all and it's still got funded. So it, 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 it's generally a good idea, but it's not an absolute requirement. Anyone want to comment on that? 
Well, the thing is, it's, it's this attitude to risk. If you put in your proposal and you're slightly worried you haven't got enough uh, information, what's the risk? What's, what's the cost to you? The thing is, if you put in a proposal and it fails, you can't put in the proposal again. And sometimes they do invite resubmission, but generally they don't. And you're blocked from putting it in again until a <coughs> certain period of time is passed. So that's the cost of putting in a, in a proposal that's not quite ready. But on the other hand, proposals that one person might say are not quite ready, if they're written in the right way, with the right zeal and excitement, they can still get through the panel, and it, it is a game of chance. And so I think there's no hard and fast rule on that one. I tend to be a bit of a risk taker, um, and I've not had any serious consequences of that. But um, you will get this advice from the panels and so forth. Oh, don't don't send in stuff that's half baked. Um, so yeah, I think if you're a perfectionist, you've got to have, you've got a bit of a problem here because you have to let go of stuff and say, okay, let's put it in. Um, Can I ask? Yeah. Uh, what do you do with work like that you have done in the core cell culture work? And, uh, it's a very good work, and you send it to a four star paper. They like the idea and everything, but then they ask for evidence in the idea. Right. Yeah. And then you haven't got money to do the interview work yeah. to answer their criticism. Then you write a grant. The grant body says, okay, great idea, but all you are doing is <laughs> you're replicating that in your own model or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So how to get over that thing? I don't think that there's no, there's no easy way to do that because there is this measure of unpredictability and subjectivity in the process. And so if if you put that into one panel, they'll say, well, you've already established that in the rat, now you try and do it in the mouse. That's incremental and it's boring. Where someone else says, well, the rat and mice are completely different. And just because it's true, you know, those are subjective opinions, and they're, and they're just way in the hand type opinions. And, and there's, there's not an easy way you can just get around that. The only way to do it is to say, well, is there another fund? You know, can I go to the Wealth and Trust with this instead of the NRC? Or can I go to the BBSC instead of the NRC? Or could I rewrite the front end and say, I'm not looking for a vaccine against Ebola, I'm just looking at the determinants of immunity to Ebola, I might be going to a different panel. You know, I think that. that as I say, there's, not, there's no easy way. There's a, there's a great degree of subjectivity. As there in peer review of, of papers, you know, if someone doesn't like it or they're grumpy, they can come up with sort of very generic things to say, to be a kind of sneering about a thing. What can you do? Um, you don't have the right to say, well, I'll have a retrial, please. You know, put it to a different panel, different referees or whatever. It just doesn't work like that, you know. Um, get your aims and objectives clear. Get clear the questions you intend to address. Now, some some um, proposals they ask you to state the hypotheses. Um, I think that's going a bit far. Uh, you know, there's this idea that Popper had that all that science is is testing hypotheses. And that contrasts with Francis Bacon's idea, which is that you just collect lots of data and the patterns fall out. You're going to have to have a hypothesis in advance. And that in fact that is the wrong thing to do because you're biasing yourself uh, and you know it, it's a philosophical point of to which of those two viewpoints is the correct way to do science they're both alternative ways to do science um, but if you can couch it in the in the form of a hypothesis or a research question that is about the real world and answers some point then you're probably going to have an easier ride up until about 15 years ago just uh, collecting data it would get um, dismissed as this is just a fishing exercise. Uh, nowadays that's a bit more acceptable because with big biology, you know, genomics and all that kind of stuff, you can do, you can say I want to sequence a thousand Daphnia genomes to establish the, you know, the changes before and after the industrial revolution and the biology of this indicative, you know, you could, you can just say I'm going to collect loads of data and I expect there to be some difference between this and that but I don't know what the difference will, you know, it, it, those kind of things can be done. And obviously they're far less risky. If you say I'm going to prove that this protein here is crucially important to the targeting of this protein to the outer membrane of the bacterium X, 
and then it turns out that it's not and you've disproven it or you've tried your hardest to disprove it but you can't you know you haven't removed it that that's much more risky than i just want to sequence the genome of this bacterium it's got a genome you will be able to sequence it and it's likely that something interesting will come out of it so it's just again so there's no black and white here it's, it's shades of gray <laughs> right now i turn into the ranting old bastard which is that presentation matters people think i'm a bit precious about this but you really do have to pay forensic attention to your typography, punctuation, spelling, grammar, and style. If you're sloppy in this, they'll assume you're sloppy in the science. If your first paragraph is in Times New Roman, your second paragraph's in Arial. Um, or, you know, the line spacing is 1.5 in the first three paragraphs and then two in the next two paragraphs. You know, they'll just say, oh, this person's just sloppy. Um, and you can argue about, well, you can't make those judgments from one domain of expertise to another, you know, just because they can't write a grant doesn't mean they can't do their work. But people do. Uh, and you, so you have to be consistent. Don't have, um, you know, a load of, your first lot of headings in bold, um, in, in aerial, and then the next lot of headings in italics in, in, in a different font. That's, that, that's not good. Um, one thing that does get people going is Latin names and plurals. So Latin binomials, you know, they have to be italicized. Um, and if you're using Latin words uh, in English, you have to use the correct plural. So if, if someone writes a proposal and says the flagella is an organelle of motility, I would just say, you illiterate bastard, get out of my office. I don't want to read your proposal. Be dead. Um, and you can say I'm unreasonable in that. Uh, but on the other hand, if, if you're not precise in that, how do I know that you're actually bothering to run your gels at the right pH? You know, I would just chuck in some water and get some kind of you know, fish bosh. You know. If you're like that with your pros, you're probably like that with your experiments. Do you think that's fair, Esther? She's done Latin at school, so she's, she, can, she can emulate pomplicity, can't she? No, you can emulate evidence-based reasons for thinking that you can judge someone I don't know. I mean, it's. Right? I think we can probably practice You can. Yes. I've seen many eminent scientists say this bacteria. Um, proofread your text. Um, one of the tricks I've learned. I mean, if you read the text on the screen, it kind of goes into one channel, and you miss all these bits where it says the. the well, you, no, on the screen, except when it says the, if you've written the, the, it gets underlined in green if you're using. Um, uh, Microsoft Word because it will recognize common errors like that. If you print it out and you're reading it, sometimes you don't see those things, your eyes just gloss over. Another trick that has come available recently is you can, for, certainly on the Mac, and I don't know about PCs, but you can actually get the computer to read it back to you. And that actually makes, forces it into a different channel in your brain, and then things that, that your eyes just glossed over when you're reading it suddenly become glaringly obvious that you said blah, blah, or left out a word or or something like that. And, um, so you can just go to speech and then start talking, select it, and it'll read it out. And in fact, I've just upgraded yesterday to the latest version of the operating system, Yosemite, and uh, they now actually have nice British voices that will read it out. You know, like you can fall in love with sat you can feed, fall in love with the person reading your grant back to because they've got such nice voices. This is just another, I'm just hammering the point home. I mean, if you, if you use this kind of typography in your grant, it's not going to work. The, re the reviewers are not going to like it. So master your word processor. Read the fine manual that goes with it. Don't ever use underline. There's all these other ways of making emphasis. This is a book I read uh, back in the 1980s, the Mac is not a typewriter. Uh, and, and, and it made that point that basically things like underline were a hangover for when you had a typewriter. And that was the only way you could add uh, emphasis to what you're doing. Whereas now you've got so many other ways to do it. Plenty of white space on the page. Uh, one of the things that really puts me off, I don't know if anyone else has seen it when you've been reviewing proposals, where you have a whole page of words with no paragraph breaks. Anyone seen that? It's just like the wall of work. It like, pushes you off your seat. And you, I don't want this. You know, give me intellectual indigestion already. You don't want that. You've got to break up that wall of words with headings, figures, lists, lines. Um, 
One thing I quite like doing is also, there's a temptation to scrunch all your references into the last two lines and just, you know, see, you know, just don't do that. Actually put the full references, because many people when they're reading a thing, oh, it is well established that such and such, and they're like, oh, how's that then? And I want to see what the evidence is. And they go and look at the title of the thing, and oh yeah, that was in nature, I remember that now. Whereas if, 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 if it's all scrunched down, then you can't do that. I, I like using highlighting, so that things that matter get put in bold. And this is useful because what you have to think about is that when your grant goes in, it will get read by the introducing members on the panel uh, at, the, at their leisure. But they may have 10, 15 of these to look at. And they might do that a few days or even a few weeks before the panel. And then on the train on the way to the panel, they'll get all those grants out again and they'll be rushing. And they'll just want to be able to speed read. And if the key points are actually highlighted in bold, then they can actually much quickly, quickly speed read it much more easily than if you didn't do that. The other thing that happens, uh, if you, many of these uh, websites, they create a PDF for you out of your Word documents. And you lay it all out nicely on, on your Word document. And then suddenly you, you create a PDF and suddenly it puts in a page break where you didn't expect there to be one. And everything suddenly just looks horrible. And so one way to actually avoid that is to create your own PDF and upload that if you can uh, do that. That's, I'm taking longer than I thought. I'm going through this perhaps too slowly, but these are all important points. Now, an interesting question, an interesting problem, is that we all suffer from this so-called curse of knowledge. We've all been so close to our subject for so long that we can't imagine that people don't know what all our jargon means and what it's all about. Um, and I came across this uh, from Steven Pinker, a Harvard professor recently. He wrote this book, uh, Sense of Style, which is, if you really want to actually learn how to write good academic English, it's probably worth going through that book. Um, towards the end it gets a bit risky, but there are good parts of it which actually have a lot of good sense. But actually the, the most important part about this curse of knowledge, he actually wrote a piece for the... Um, the Wall Street Journal, there's a URL there. And he says, you know, what, why is so much writing so bad? Why is it so hard to understand a government form, an academic article, instructions for setting up a wireless home network? And he says, you know, most it, people would think, well, it's because the person's trying to deliberately be obscure, aren't they? Um, but he said, it's not, it's not that straightforward. He said he attended a lecture on biology, and the guy just went into jargon straight away and lost his audience. And the problem is, it's this curse of knowledge. It's the difficulty for you to imagine what it's like to be someone who doesn't know these things. So one of my colleagues was writing a proposal about, she wanted to look at the pathogenesis of staph aureus infection, and she said she was going to investigate autophagy. I said, have you ever told us what autophagy is? Um, and she just assumed, I think, that everyone would know what it meant. And, you know, you can get picky and say, well, if someone doesn't know what autophagy is, they shouldn't be reading my grant. The fact of the matter is that the introducing member on those panels is not going to be someone who is a real expert in your field. They're going to be someone, you know, you'll get someone who is a cell biologist or a microbiologist or an immunologist, but they, they, might, they won't be looking at maybe at uh, bacterial infections. Uh, they may be looking at something. You know, so you have to just pause the thought and explain what is autophagy and what's important about it and so forth. Um, and that this is one of those challenges to actually step back enough. I mentioned earlier that you don't want to go back and say DNA, structure of DNA, quick and once. You don't want to have to keep going back and defining every last thing. So again, it's a matter of degree. And this is where getting one of your colleagues to look at the stuff and say, well, I can't, I, I, you know, in this case, I said to her, well, I've got a vague idea what autophagy is, but, you know, that was something they invented after I graduated. And, uh, you know, can you just explain it to me? You know, you, you need to do that to get yourself in that, in that person's shoes. More of the same here. Perhaps I'm saying less is more and then not following my own advice. I'm just making this point again, which is that you, you've got to retain the interest of that introducing member who is not a, a garden wall expert in your field. Anyone know what TLDR stands for? Yeah, too long didn't live. So basically, a wall of words, you think, right your eyes, oh, look, I just want, I've got half an hour to read this, I just can't be bothered with this. Uh, and you just try and get it off the desk, you know, 
whatever way you can. The thing about the way the BBSSE works, and this may be a specific thing with the BBSSE, and it may not, the advice may not work in other situations, say NHR, uh, NIH, is that if you write, you've got six pages, you make your case, and you say, you know, do all this, and run these gels, uh, and analyze it this way, blah, blah. If a reviewer then says, I can't review this, unless they tell me whether they're using TBE or TAE to run their gels, do you have a chance to respond to that? Because you have this chance to respond to the reviewer comment. And you can say, we'd like to clarify that in our lab we use TBE for these reasons. But if you go in and you specify all the details and all the caveats in your case for support, you're introducing members just going to say, oh, this is as much fun as reading the telephone directory on board of this. You know, and this Coronation Street start, or you can have my lunch. You know, it, it's, it, so you get that chance there to, to, to come back. Uh, and it's better to write something that's short and exciting, um, and that leaves out a bit of the detail, and it is to write something that's absolutely packed full of technical detail but is turgid. Stick to the word limits and page limits. One of the things that people try and do is they try and squeeze the margins as short, as narrow as possible, because I, I cannot. I've got to tell you all these important things. No, just cut your words, not the margins. <coughs> if necessary, and you feel that you need to make a point, and you can't make it in those six pages of your case for support, sometimes you can get that information and you can put it somewhere else in the proposal, so it's still in there. So there are these the various summaries. There's a lay summary and there's a technical summary. There's impact statements, justification. Somewhere in those places, you can actually make that point you want to make and not have to make it in the, in the body text of your justification. Uh, of your um, case for support. Adopt the right register. So don't come use this very strange academic form of telephone voice, posh telephone voice. Some people, they think they have to put on airs and graces when they write uh, this kind of thing. And a former colleague of mine has a, got to say that the, one of the great advantages that worked in at Birmingham was that the people there could apprise themselves of the hostelry on the premises or something. Why don't you say they can go to the bar together? <coughs> they don't have to use all this silly language. Um, don't blind the, the, the reader with technical detail. So jargon only when necessary. You know, a spade is a spade. It's not a linear bladed agricultural implement for excavation of loam, mud and humic deposits. So here's an example. This is like a, a long distance view of one of my proposals. So you, you're not expected to actually read the words on it, but you can just see the way it's laid out. Um, so, so the text is broken up, there are some figures there to catch the eye's attention, uh, there are various headings, there's a little quote there at the top in italics from Stanley Falcon. On the top. So you get this um, plenty of white space and a, and a kind of broken up text that the eye can run over and you can see also that some parts of it are bolded so that if someone really wants to review this in the last five minutes before they're walking in to introduce it they can just speed read it quickly. Here's another one um, where I've broken up the page using horizontal lines as a way. Uh, that's actually a very efficient use of space. If you have a horizontal rule there, uh, you can actually get away without having to have too many paragraph breaks before and after. But here we've got a list, a bulleted list, slightly indented, so that it just breaks up the text. And if you do this, it just makes it easier for the person to read it, and they don't get that sinking feeling, oh my god, I've got to digest all these bloody words. Um, I'm repeating myself here, aren't I? I've already said this so many times, but this elevator pitch, plain English, clear objectives, nice, nice laid out lines of argument. And remember that they will have, say, 15 of these proposals to look at as introduce. Remember they'll have 30 or 90, uh, 60 or 90 of them to go through on the day. If you've got something a bit quirky about yours that stands out, a turn of phrase or whatever, um, that can make it work. So I used this phrase, the scatterings of virulence, when I was talking about the fact that these genes associated with particular pathogens um, were not found in one lockers, but scattered around the genome. One of my colleagues said, oh, that's a very nice turn of phrase. You know. The problem is that you can, you can overdo it, and then you can get into gimmickry. Um, so you have to be careful. Another example was um, when we were doing these Birmingham Fellowship interviews in Birmingham a, few, a couple of years ago, and I had you know, like 30 people to interview over four days, One, and they weren't allowed to use PowerPoint. They were talking about the work without PowerPoint, and this guy 
said, oh, I'm going to describe this uh, transporter system that sits in there, this bacterial cell envelope. I'm not allowed to use PowerPoint, but I'm illustrating it with these bits of fruit. So I've got an apple here, it's in the inner membrane, orange is in the outer membrane, this banana connects the two. Um, and we all remembered it, we called him the fruit man. And in fact, he gave us a handout, and then on his handout, he had the little bits of fruit in, in the margin. It's a little logo. So you have to, yeah, if you, you can alienate the reader if you go too much down that route. Um, but it is, uh, it, it, it's something to think about. So here's um, some close-up words of one of mine, where I'm starting the background, the importance of chickens, uh, and I'm just you know, trying to lay it on thick. It's a special place in science and society, the most common domesticated animal, the most important food animal, the most abundant and widely distributed bird. You know, you're basically establishing what you're doing is important. You're not just working in some small, obscure area of science. And you can usually weave a narrative to say this kind of thing about whatever you're doing. You know, the toenail. Is a very important organ in the human body that causes a huge amount of distress and blah 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 blah. You know, you can you can find a way. Um, and as you can see, I've also put uh, some bold there. Most of the health of chickens contributes to the wealth of nations. Um, case you know, overegging it to excuse of how, how near right now. It's not just important, it's important in the history of science. Uh, and then some numbers. You know, the UK is home to 25, uh, 29 million egg laying. And over a uh, hundred million. Well, so when, if you can actually put numbers in, it, it, it gives much more value, to, uh, much more cred credibility to what you're saying. Another important thing is that it's what psychologists call priming: is that if you use positive language, people actually pick up on your enthusiasm. And, and this is a funny thing. If you use these kind of words that I put up there um, and sprinkle them through your text. The, the, the reader will actually come away feeling much more positive about your work. But it's a bit like seduction. If the person knows they're being seduced, and they, in fact, if, if you put too many of these words and you make, them, make it too much like this, then they'll see through and say, ah, oh, this person's trying to bamboozle me with all this pompous nonsense, you know, ridiculous nonsense. So it's just you just have to get it right, get this... You know, here's another way of looking at the same kind of words. All these words, they kind of bleed into your mind. Um, in psychology, it's called priming, and there's a famous study where they got the people to, to sort some words, and they gave one half the class, and then the words to do with being old and decrepit and slow and declining, and another group, they gave them words to do with being young and uh, energetic and so forth. And they showed, supposedly, in this study, that the people who did the old words, when they left their desk at the end of the exercise, they walked more slowly out of the room. Um, uh, and this is what a lot of uh, advertising is trying to do, trying to get inside your head and change your way of thinking. Um, okay, describe tasks and subtasks. That's the way I do it. Some people call them work packages. But when you're describing this, your program of those work, you can't go Moby Dick and just have this stream of conscience, I'm going to do a bit of this, a bit of that, and other. You've got to actually um, break it down and, and make it clear. Um, I'm running out of time here, aren't I? Um, if you want to damn a grant and you don't want to read it, you can just say, oh, it's unfocused, no, over-ambitious. You can say that about anything you want. Um, and what you have to do is avoid that. by trying to, Don't be all things to all people. Leave those terms that, you know, it, you can't do everything in your field. Um, so try and, try and set the limits and say, well, I'm, I'm doing this much but I'm stopping there and I'm not going further in this proposal. Maybe we'll lay the ground for further proposals in this proposal, but we won't be doing that. And actually just drawing the limits is actually a worthwhile thing. And the other thing is that if you say, I'm going to, I'm going to clone 100 genes. It's hard for me. I might not be able to clone those 100 genes. Yeah, but if I can clone 50 of them, that's still a thing worth doing. If you make the point that even getting partway there is still worthwhile, that, that's an important thing. Um, I didn't realise I was going to run out of time so much. But another problem you've got in terms of the program proposed work is that you mustn't rely on a linear progression of tasks. So you mustn't say we're going to sequence the transcriptome of this organism um, and then we're going to pull out all the small RNAs uh, that might have originated. 
because someone said, well, hang on, um, what happens if you can't get this transcriptomic sequencing to work? Um, then you've got no, nothing else to work on afterwards. Well, you know, we're going to do the protein, we're going to choose you know, a load of proteins that are differentially regulated between this and that. But what if you don't find any that are differentially regulated? Then you've got nothing else to work on later on. So you can't have this thing where you say success in class A is required for B, success in B for C, and so forth. And if, if, if you write a proposal like that, and the reviewer just wants to get it off the desk and throw it in the bin, they'll say, well, if it's clear that the task that one doesn't work, then none of the rest of it can follow. Too risky. You've got to provide parallel strands, so you've got things that, that are not completely interdependent. They might add synergy to each other. But they are independent. So you might say, oh, I'm going to characterize these things using one technique, and then I'm going to characterize them by another. Or I've already got 50 small RNAs, uh, but I'm now going to look at the whole genome, and I hope I might find 200 more. I've got 50 anyway, and if I never find any more, I've still got something to work on. Um, the other thing about positivity in language is to actually project yourself <coughs> into the future. And think to yourself, you're going to give me this money. You don't use all these certain institutions that, if successful, we propose to. Just say, we will. You know, imagine you're looking at the garden. You, you're reviewing my garden, you're going to give me the money. You know, and you point your finger at me, and you're, you're projecting that forward. Um, this is, uh, speaks to the same point I made earlier about the curse of knowledge. If you're saying something about uh, a method or whatever, don't assume that everyone else knows what you mean. I saw this, saw something very similar to this in a proposal written by an FRS. You know, we will use so-and-so's method for this. Well, how does anyone know who so-and-so is? You haven't even explained what their method is. You haven't explained what's novel and new and exciting about their method. You can't assume that the reader will know that. Uh, Timetable. Um, project management, these are all important things. Like it, it suggests that it's not just a vague idea, you actually have concrete plans for how this is going to come about. Uh, costings. If you overdo it and ask for too much money, they'll throw it out as greedy. They'll say, this person's greedy, and they'll tip a switch, and they'll, and they'll, and they'll, and they'll say, ah, this person's not serious. Um, so, for me, the rule of thumb is about 15 to 17 k per year. Is that what you, you recommend for lab-based consumables, something like that? Is that what you, you know, 20 if you're really, really pushing it. Now, if you're doing something that is very expensive, like I want to sequence a thousand daphnia strains or something, um, and you can't do it any other way, it's going to cost 50,000 pounds to do that in the sequencing, then you just have to say that and do it uh, and justify it. But if you're just saying, I want you know, some money for buying polypropylene tubes and, and enzymes and blah, blah, blah. If you come up with beyond the, much beyond that, they'll give you grief. Um, if you put down an unnamed postdoc, they just give you the basic minimum. Um, and, and that's something you have to be aware of. Um, and if you add a tech, you can add a technician or co-investigator. And again, it's... Are you tripping the switch to say, oh, this person's been greedy or not? And, and so I, I think actually most of the time if you put co-investigator on, you don't trip that switch. Because um, if you say, all right, so-and-so is a bioinformatician and he's got a, you know, he'll add something to this, put down 5% of his salary. You get, you get that guy's salary, 5% of his salary, you help protect him against being made redundant when the bad times come and all that. And it, <coughs> it doesn't really make a cost for your grant. And if everyone, I, I mean, I made this point before, that this idea of entanglement, that you actually entangle everyone in each other's grants and get as much salary back as you can by asking 5% on each of these proposals, um, that may work. One of the interesting things, it's a kind of irony, is that we have all, every university has a bunch of mathematical models who can produce all these wonderful models. Nobody ever models the process of getting grants. They should be able to go back and, and take a huge database and say, if you had a co-investigator, it doesn't make any difference. Or if you had a co-investigator, you're 10% less likely to get the grant. We don't know the exact answers to those questions, but my impression is that you can get away with it. Um, this is one of the shadow line issues. That thing about, if you ask for a postdoc, it's unnamed, they'll just 
default to the site, spinal point six. Um, and it, it's a double whammy actually, because the research council defaults to a thing, and then this university is the most miserly university, and they always default to pay the person minimum on the scale as their default. Um, so the way to get around that is to actually have a named postdoc on the grant. This guy, John Smith, has the right skill set, he's had 10 years experience, perfect person for this job. Put them down. It helps the grant get funded because it makes it look more feasible, but it also allows you to ask for a higher salary allocation. Now, if that guy, John Smith, is really going to come and do the work, that's fine. If he what if he's kind of not sure? If he's got several different options? Are you naming him name postdoc? My idea is that if, if that person has not said, I'm definitely not doing this, then it's fine. What if they say, well, it's a 10% chance of doing this, but actually I want to go to Australia, and it's 90% chance I'm going to take up a postdoc on, on the Gold Coast and go surfing. But if I really have to be stuck in the West Midlands, I suppose I'll do my salary, so you can put me down. You know, there's that shadow line there. When, when, when if they definitely say they're not going to take the job under any circumstances, and you just use their CV, is that ethical? I don't know. Anyone want to vote that it is ethical? Has anyone ever done it? Okay. Anyone think it's anyone outraged that I should even suggest such a thing? Anyone think it's terribly unethical? They're definitely not going to take it. Definitely. She's she, she sort of meant this stock. I am not. You talk to you were. I'm sure you talk. <laughs> Aren't you? Oh, I made it up. Anyway, it, it, it's an interesting question. I think if if they're definitely not taking the job, it probably is. It probably is going too far. I, think I have to say that in France, this is common practice. Because they are asking when you uh, and the uh, government gives you uh, money, you have to put staff, uh, uh, name staff, yeah. to, uh, with their time. Yeah. And then, uh, so, yeah. So, once you get, so the funny thing is, you go through all these issues to get the grant. Once you've got the grant, you go to the post-grant award section, who, you know, they spend the day smoking cannabis and looking out the window. They don't care. You can sue them. You can write them money. They don't, they, you know. It's all very pernickety as you're writing the proposal. Once you've got the money, you can buy it quite generously and, and all sorts, you know. Um, getting your first draft reviewed. Uh, so this is, uh, we've kind of mentioned these points in passing, but they're very important, actually getting someone to look at it, um, submitting it, you know, arrange in advance to get the approvals. This is where we say, yes, you must go to Iris as well in advance. One of the things you can do, though, is you can parallelise the work. So obviously, getting the finances signed off is one thing. I need a postdoc. I want £17,000 a year for my consumable. I want whatever, £2,000 a year. You can get those sums sorted out. You can pass them on to finance, and they can say, well, if you want John Smith, he's going to cost this much, and, and they can work it all out. But you can still be fine-tuning your case for support in parallel with that. So you can go around and adjust it and you can get it peer reviewed. So you don't actually have to, I, I, I reject the idea that you have to have a perfectly polished piece of work, three weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, whatever the deadline is before. Um, you, have to, you have to get these things, um, the things that actually need to be done in advance, done in advance, but something, you could actually write the case for support, fine tune the case for support, not write it entirely, but you can fine tune it right up to the last minute, 12 hours. Does that raise tackles? No. Yeah, exactly. Um, but Jez, you know, knows when you're in a hurry. Don't sit down at half past three when the deadline for submission is four o'clock and think that you can just upload your proposal. Uh, I think Jez does go down under times of high demand. It has done, I think, in the past. Yeah, Sometimes the they can, do. the systems just go, you know, if there's a deadline for a thing at four o'clock on a Tuesday, it might not be working at half past three on a Tuesday. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. um, we've run out of time, haven't we, really? Near, peer, you, can, you can put down peer reviewers, and it's a good idea to get people you know and trust. Uh, and it's the same kind of arguments we're making about the people on the panel. If you have enemies or competitors and you don't want to peer review it, you can say, please don't attend to this person. Another trick you can do is you can flatter their egos and you can say, ah, oh, Dr. Bastard at the Sanger Institute, I don't want him to be reviewing this. 
I'll ask him to sit on the steering wheel for the, for, for the project. Um, and if he says, yeah, all right, then he's conflicted. And if he says no, then you can say, well, please don't send it to him because we've already asked him to be on the steering wheel and he's, he's refused and he's, he's kind of conflicted. Um, you know, th those, th those kind of games you can play. Um, with the BBSC, you get a right to reply to the viewers' comments, and you should use that opportunity, um, and you should try and fill in the gaps, correct misconceptions. Don't ever just presume that, oh, I can't be bothered to respond to this. Because if you don't respond, if there's a no, nil return, then the panel will take a dim view of the sales person, but obviously doesn't care about this grant. Um, and, you know, even if you think that it's all looking rosy, then just saying something to, to, to in response is a good idea. Um, one of the things is that the, the, it, the panels make a decision, but their decision is not the final decision. They make a recommendation, usually, and then that permeates through the organisation, and that has to get ratified by another group of people later on. Um, and, and often there is a lag of a month or six weeks between the panel and the actual money going out. And it, for some reason, the, the BBSC seems to have changed its way of doing things. In the past, they would let you know, well, actually you've bombed out, sorry, after the panel. Or they'd say, well, you're well in the funds and range, I should be doing good if I were you. Whereas now it's all totally locked down and you're not supposed to find out. You can cross the shadow line by just going to the folk, your mate on the panel and say, did I get it then? And they'll say, I can't say. And you say, well, if I didn't get it, raise your left eyebrow, um, or, or smile, or something. You, know, you, can, you can try and find out, but it's again, it's a matter of whether you're putting too much pressure on those people. Um, so I've had it before where people have, have been quite adequate to tell me, yeah, you got funded. Um, or sometimes they say, yeah, you got funded, but we have to work bloody hard for it. You should have written a better proposal, you bastard. Um, and so the thing is, the decision is non-negotiable. You can't, you can't go back to the panel and say, sorry, don't you know who I am? You made a mistake. <laughs> you can't do that, I'm afraid. Um, and, and, you, and that's where it is difficult. If, if you ask one of your mates on the panel and he says you didn't get it, there's no point in you bad-mouthing him. Uh, and there's no point in writing to the panel afterwards and saying you people don't understand this kind of research or, or you're just all rubbish or whatever. It's just you don't personalise it. Um, the time limit we've mentioned. Um, you have to once you've got the money. Of course, we spent an hour, over an hour and a half talking about how to get the money. That's just the beginning. You've got three years, and you've got to bloody deliver. Um, and that's very important. You've got to feed research fish now. This stupid thing that they ask you to go in every now and then and say what papers you've got. Out. I find it. Then. Does anyone else like? Does anyone like research fish? Does anyone actually dislike it? And designed by a committee, and I don't know, it's just rubbish. Um, if you don't get funding, find, try and find out why. It's often bad luck. Try and rectify the faults. From it. But, you know, try and maintain your mental robustness. But don't take it personally. Um, you need to maintain a sense of, of optimism. Um, and, and it's worth remembering that no grant is ever created or destroyed. It's merely recycled to a different funding stream. MRC didn't like it, send it to the BBSRC. Uh, if the BBSRC don't like it, then send it to NERC. And, and always, I will try and have one proposal on the go. So when I get turned down a grant, I didn't get that one, but I've got another one. I'll find out still whether I'm going to get that. And you can still maintain that sense of, um, of, of optimism. A reality distortion field. If, if you re want to read a good book, read the job. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs' biography, you know, the guy was a complete arse, he had a complete reality distortion field, as his colleagues all called it. And he thought he could achieve things that anyone else would have said that's impossible, but he actually did them, because he could distort reality. Um, stay balanced. So, there we are. I've finished. It's up to you now to go and write your poems. Um, has anyone got any points to raise? That's not a very nice thing to say to a young lady. It's got a swear word in it. But it, it, it just... Uh
forces that issue into your head. I mean, just do it. And we can often find excuses not to. And I'm actually going to meet someone from RSS in a few minutes to work out whether I'm going to put in a proposal for a rather interesting investigation in the deadline for the people's day then. Um, and it's one of those things am I going to do it or not do it? And uh, you can always find excuses not to do things. You can always procrastinate. You know, that temptation. I mean, luckily, in some ways, it's good that the, some of the panel, I think the BBS used to have four rounds a year, now they only have three. So you have to make that choice. Am I putting this in now, or am I going to wait another four months? And you have to realise it takes six months for things to get through the system. Which is under, you know, almost a year away before you get Anyway, that's all I want to say.